So I need to tell you about uh, two theologians that you probably don't know about. Uh, one is named Ellie May, and the other one's name is Phoebe. Uh, they are brilliant, though very young. One's about four or five years old. We don't really know. The other one's about 11 years old. Uh, and it just so happens that they're Jack Russell Terriers. Uh, but those of you who know Jack Russell Terriers will know that it would not be surprising at all for them to be theologians. Uh, they are brilliant animals. Um, Jack Russells are smart, right? Some dogs are smart. These dogs are like pick door locks smart. Uh, they're also wise. So it's Thanksgiving Day, and, uh, and I'm at my uh, lovely dinner table or getting ready to be there. And, <laughs> um, and you all know that I'm a little bit introverted, right? So I'm kind of not looking forward to another hour of conversation. Um, so, so I just eat. Eat and, and observe. Uh, and I observe and observe, and then I notice that something is different. Um, my dogs typically hang out underneath the table, uh, usually very close to the toddler, uh, which makes sense, but they moved. It's maybe because there were extra feet under the table, but they moved to underneath the new baby's high chair with the thing because they probably have observed that the baby now is into that thing where she picks up and does that a whole lot, a lot, a whole lot. Right? Um, so they moved. And I looked at them, and here they are, and they are perfectly still. Another thing we don't say about Jack Russell's very often. For the whole hour, just. <laughs> the whole time. Uh, until, and then they were there, right? They had, I think, learned how to wait well over the years. Uh, but what I noticed that was so wise about them is that they learned how to wait well by placing themselves in the place of most potential, <laughs> uh, close to the baby now, and, uh, and definitely not close to, to the dad because I, I never give them any food. But they also learned how to wait and wait and wait, and they know that if either one of them stops looking, that'll be the moment that the food comes off the tray and the other dog gets it, right? So don't ever lose your gaze. They stay right there. It's pretty amazing. So I was pondering this. Uh, how is it exactly that I'm 30, I'll just say 30-something years old, and my dogs are teaching me about patience and waiting uh, and how to do it well? And, uh, and I think it's because they don't have to deal with some of the other distractions that I have to deal with. I'm just going to blame that. Uh, but they, they're incredible, and I wanted to learn from them. And I considered that especially as we do this thing for the next couple of weeks called Advent. This is our season of preparation for Christmas, uh, and it is not just about preparing for this sort of celebratory time in the year, but it's about learning how to wait well for what God does. Um, it's about the first people who are waiting and waiting patiently, but a special kind of patient for the thing that God was going to do and how we are those same people. So how is it that we go about the business not only of waiting for the next amazing thing that God's going to do, but waiting well by pacing ourselves in this place of maximum potential, sure, by keeping our eyes open, um, and by cultivating a certain level of expectation. I think those are three major parts. Jesus tells his disciples um, a, a couple of really amazing things. It, twice he says, look. Behold, keep your eyes open to see something like the fig tree. When the fig tree starts to bud in the spring, in the late spring, summer's already here. You don't have to wonder what the next thing is going to be. You don't have to do anything to make summer come. You can't do anything to make summer come. But just look and have faith that it's around the corner. And he says to them, look at the world around you and see all this stuff that's happening. And you'll know something about the redemption that is coming, that the kingdom is coming. You can't make it happen, just have faith that it is on its way. So he tells them in this parable, though, uh, this extra thing. It's on its way. 
but you can miss it if you don't wait well. Uh, in our uh, version today, I <laughs> he has this sort of thing where uh, he has the two polar ends of what it would mean to uh, to not wait well. You cannot wait well by uh, by being so burdened by the worries of this world. Your heart will get heavy. Your eyes won't be open to see it. Your eyes won't be open to see the new thing that God is doing, the way that God is spreading peace and love and joy into the world. You won't be open for Christmas if your heart is too burdened. But he also says, and don't get drunk too, because, you know, <laughs> right? Don't dull your ability to see by doing the exact other side either, by throwing yourself headlong into to revelry, right? Um, find a place in between those two things. Navigate those waters and keep your eyes open. I love, there's a, you all know the message, the Bible translation called The Message. Uh, a guy named Eugene Peterson wrote that. And I frequently don't like what Eugene Peterson did with his translations because I'm a Bible nerd. Uh, but he got this thing exactly right when he translated today's gospel. He said, don't let the sharp edge of your expectation be dulled by the parties and the shopping and the worries of this world. I somehow find myself every year as we lead up into Christmas uh, dealing with those th three things. I got to get ready for Christmas. I need to shop. I need to plan. I need to finish that bed that I started for my daughter last year. I need to, <laughs> I need to do all these projects and clean the house and do these things. And uh, I've got like a thousand parties to go to, and I'm going to go to all of them uh, <laughs> and have a blast at every single one of them. Uh, and I'm not going to risk turning off the TV so that I don't have to deal with the fact that every single week it seems like there's that next thing that we hear about or read about that burdens our hearts. Or even within our own lives, it always seems to be right around Christmas uh, that people that I know and love have that crushing thing. How do we learn, how do we cultivate a sort of expectation and waiting that doesn't result in a dull edge of expectation. That doesn't get weighed down by those things or give up on those things because we're too busy partying. Um, how do we do that? I'm convinced that how we do that is not by doing more and doing more uh, better, but by doing less and learning how to do that well. I think that's part of what Jesus was telling his disciples. Don't get too far on those edges. Just keep your eyes open. Uh, there is a, <clears throat> a way of talking about this uh, theologically, and this is where there really is a theologian. These are not my dogs. Uh, there are two Latin words for the word future. One of them will be easy to recognize, futurum. Sounds like future, right? Uh, and that is the, the future as we kind of know it, right? The future that that springs forth or unfolds from the past. The almost predictable future. It's the future actually that my dogs are really good at. Why are they underneath the, the new baby? Because the new baby throws food all over the place. So of course, right? I can see what's happened in the past. I know where to be. That's futurum. There is another word for the future. Anybody want to take a guess? I'll give you a clue. It's the name of our season. Advent. Adventus, because uh, we have to do the Latin thing, Adventus. Adventus is the future that arrives on our doorstep and we never saw it coming. If futurum is the future that comes out of the past, it develops out of the past, springs forth out of everything that's happened before, and you can almost predict that it's going to happen, Advent is the future that just shows up and usually right after it shows up, we can look back and say, oh, yeah, 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 I could have seen that coming. Uh, but we never could have seen it coming, right? Advent is the future that arrives on the doorstep of Abraham and Sarah, who in their old age never could have looked at their past and said, yeah, it's likely that we're probably going to have a kid any day now, right? No chance. But Advent shows up. God says, there's a new thing coming. Keep your eyes open and I'll do something new. The Israelites 
should have never, based on the past, decided to follow a guy like Moses and Aaron out into the wilderness, much less through the Red Sea. Uh, every, every time they had ever been in water before, they probably should have looked at the Red Sea and said, you know, it might not be a really good idea to cross this right now. Um, and yet, Advent says, do it anyway. Advent is this constant unfolding of the new thing that God is doing in our midst that we couldn't have possibly seen before because it comes from God. In fact, the way that the theologians will talk about it is Advent is the way that God interacts with our history. Our history is futurum, the history that unfolds, that progresses. God's history is the thing that surprises us, that brings love and joy and faithfulness into our midst in spite of the fact that we couldn't see it before. And in spite even of evidence to the contrary, it's, it's pretty amazing. Advent is what happens when Jesus is born and most people didn't see it because their eyes weren't open, because they were too busy focusing on the things that were coming out of the past. Futurum. Advent is a season that tells us that if we want to see the next thing that happens that God is going to do that is amazing, we want to see the next beautiful sign of God's love and God's peace and the kingdom coming to our midst. Don't get burdened with a heavy heart that's based on your past, with a heavy heart that's based on your present, with the things that dull your senses. Open your eyes and wait. Carefully wait, patiently wait for the new dawn of what God is going to do. As I considered that this week, I was reminded of, of uh, a sort of a one-sentence way of remembering this. Uh, when I was in seminary, uh, every now and then you hear us talk about our, our training as chaplains. Uh, each one of us typically goes through about a three-month period where we are chaplain interns in hospitals. Uh, and I served at Columbia University Medical Center in New York City, uh, part of the New York Presbyterian deal, and it had uh, its hospital for adults, and then it was... Children's Hospital of New York right on the same campus. Uh, and uh, it was incredible and also exceptionally difficult. Uh, one of my units was the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, I learned a lot uh, about what it is to be a human being and to love other people while there. Um, I also learned a lot about what to do and what not to do. And the thing that was said to me the first day I was there ended up being the most true thing that anybody said to me the entire time I was there. The... Uh, the person knew how seminarians were, and she said, no matter what you think you know, when you step into someone's room, forget it. <laughs> um, don't bring that stuff into the room with you, because all that stuff has trained you to answer the thing that, uh, that has been calling in our lives because that's how we are, and that thing can be summed up this way. Uh, don't just stand there, do something, right? We've all heard that or felt that got to do something. She said, as soon as you hear your brain scream that, when you start to walk into a room, stop and breathe. Wash your hands again. Say a prayer. Do whatever you have to do. And say to yourself, don't just do something. Stand there. Walk into that room with whoever those people are. And don't do a thing, but introduce yourself Tell them who you are and stand there. And if you wait, you'll see God. You'll hear God's voice. You'll have a prayer. You'll know what their needs are. They'll tell you what they might need. You won't jump to the first anxiety that comes in the room because you'll be able to discern what you ought to do. And probably what you ought to do most is hold hands and cry and stand there and not do anything else. It became, through seminary, the thing that I kept saying, oh yeah, I should remember to do that, and I kept forgetting to do it. It still is that way, all these years later. That was 2009. I have to remind myself all the time. This world is full of things that will scream at you. You've got to do something. And especially in the next couple of weeks going into Christmas, Think of all the things you have to do. I mean, don't think about it long because you'll start to get that anxiety that comes up, right? But 
you've got family coming in. Maybe you just had family leave too, and so you've got, but you've got four weeks to get your house reset. You've got decorations to put up. You've got parties to go to. You've got shopping to do. You've got this and you've got that and you've got the other thing. Don't just do something. Don't fill your life full of stuff over the next four weeks. Because if you do that, you are guaranteed to be caught so much in futurum. To the old thing that you can expect to happen because it always happens or because you know it's going to happen, it's predictable. And it's not that it's bad. It's just not even close to the glory that God is going to reveal for every single one of us. There is this thing that God is doing in this world over the next four weeks. Don't just do stuff. Slow down. Pray. Think. Figure out what things you need to let go of. Very, very carefully decide what things you want to do instead. And wait carefully and look because every single day God's advent is in our lives, showing us peace and joy and love, making it real, making it personal, and inviting you to experience it. Over the next four weeks, keep your eyes open so you can see the new thing that God is doing in our lives together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.